Hey everyone, welcome back to another online service. Uh, so grateful to be with you. My name's Jalen, if we haven't met. I mean, we should have met by now. I've been around for a long time, but just in case we haven't, my name's Jalen. Grateful to be here and just grateful to be a part of the East Town family. Hey, if you're new with us, I want to invite you in this moment to check in with us. It's really easy to do. You text the word East Town, all one word, to the number 9400. Zero. Please check in. Let us know you're here. We've got a gift for you too. We just want to get to know you a little better. You know, being here in the Bay Area actually uh, is just, it's awesome. Anytime I can come out, I just have a great time. And, and this past week, I was able to uh, celebrate a team night with East Town leaders. And it was awesome just kind of being in person with each other and actually being able to dialogue in person with everyone and getting to know the team better. As I start, start, started coming around, early on in the pandemic, but it's great. It's really great to be here. So today I'm not going to be with you all super long, but I just wanted to take a moment as we're in this series called Storyline to just share a little bit from my heart, especially on what I've seen God doing recently in my own life. Today we're talking about provision, provision, simply the way that God provides for each and every one of us. This is a topic that, you know, I'll be honest, I still wrestle with at times of really being able to struggle, really being able to rest and lean into understanding that God is a provider. His word tells us that's exactly who he is. You know, um, recently in life, you know, my life has taken a big shift probably in the last six months. I left a full-time job at a church that I was a part of for close to four years, honestly, to pursue where I thought God was calling me. And in that time, I mean, I've had so many different ideas and projects that I felt the Lord calling me to that I've pursued. And one of the most recent ones, I'm from Detroit. I created a, a, a program called the Detroit Sound. And so if you don't know, I'm an artist. Like that's the first thing I grew up doing was singing and playing the piano. I watched my dad do it and then I grew up doing it myself. So I love music. I lead worship, I sing and do all that kind of stuff. And so honestly, like I wanted a way, you know, now that I'm not really so into the artist scene in the Metro Detroit area where I'm from, um, I wanted a way to be able to uh, still expose and highlight and give platform to the emerging artist community in the Metro Detroit area. So I came up with an idea to go out and to uh, gather a bunch of local Metro Detroit artists who were releasing new music and up and coming in the Detroit area and give them a platform to record a video a concert, a virtual concert that really featured them and their original music. And so in order to do that, it took a little bit of investment. I had to spend a little bit of money in order to get the video taken care of, in order to assemble the people, the band, take care of production costs and food and things like that. And so in doing that, um, it was something that my wife and I talked about. And I said to her, I said, I really feel the Lord's calling me to do this. And I'm, I'm just going to take a little bit of, of the money we have to put into this because I really think that God is calling me to do this, to use my artistry to leverage moments where we can highlight the artist community and the emerging community here in the Detroit area. And so my wife was 100% on board with that. So we pursued it and we created this awesome and amazing virtual concert. And so uh, just to be fully transparent, in order to pull that concert off, it was upwards close to about $4,000 in order to do it. And so as we were doing it and creating it, I put the money into it. I was also hoping to sell tickets to this event. And I was selling these tickets in efforts to be able to give back to the artist community and keep this thing going. It wasn't to necessarily make a profit for myself, but it was to bring in money to support the artist community in the Detroit area. So we pull off the concert, but I don't sell the number of tickets that I need to hit. And I start getting a little upset and I said, Lord, I feel like you called me to this. Why wasn't this successful? And so all of a sudden I was able to work out a deal with the person that had uh, shot the video and he cut me a deal. He said, hey, Jalen, you know what? Just give me what you owe me, which was $2,000. He said, give me what you owe me. Just give it to me in halves. He's like, just give me a thousand here and a thousand later. 
And so I had a conversation with him in the morning. And I said, no problem, man. Uh, I'll take care of that for you. I'll get you that $1,000 as soon as I can. I went to a, uh, a worship service that was at this prayer house that, uh, that happens in uh, Metro Detroit area. And we were worshiping and gathering. And at the end of it, a uh, lady comes up to me and she says, hey, Jalen, um, as I was praying and as we were worshiping, I just felt the Lord wanted me to give this to you. And she reaches out and hands me a check. I get in my car, open up that check. It's a check for $1,000. Exactly what I needed to pay the videographer friend that I'd hired to do the Detroit Sound. And it was in that moment where I just had a moment where I looked up and I said, you know, Jesus, forgive me for ever getting upset because you always show up and provide. You always provide. Every time I look around and you call me to something, when I don't think there's enough, there seems to always be enough. Now, I know I'm not the only one. I know we all have moments in our lives where we forget what God has done. We have moments where we get anxious about the things that are happening, things that we are doing that we feel God called us to. We aren't necessarily fully believing or trusting that he has the ability to provide like he tells us he does. And so I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. There's probably moments right now in your life where you're frustrated. And you're like, Lord, where are you? You said that you'd be with me. We all regularly have these moments, these moments where we are involved and we're pursuing something or something's not necessarily working out and we're expecting the Lord to show up, but we don't really have the trust or the faith that he's actually going to be able to provide. I know I have those moments regularly. I know they happen for me more often than I'd like to admit, but I think there's a few simple concepts that we can look at that will help us to recenter ourselves in a way that in moments where we feel the pressing happening, where we feel the struggle happening, we can look to God to really see and understand him and know him as the provider that he says he is to be. It all starts with looking back, looking up, and looking forward. But before we jump into that, I want to read a story. It's a story in the Bible where Jesus does one of his many miracles. And this is the story where he feeds the 5,000. And it's in John chapter 6, starting at verse 1. And I'll read it here. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went. Because they saw his miraculous signs, and he healed the sick people. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. You know, in reading that story, it's a story that many of us may have already heard. For some of us, it could be new. But it's pretty much a story that is really well known when you look at the miracles of Jesus. And when we really dive into this story and we get a little bit 
of context, we understand in the story that for Jesus to be able to provide in this way, even to us, it was a miracle. But even then, it was even more profound. There's a part of this where it says, the, where we'll notice that it says that the men alone numbered about 5,000. In this time, like they didn't, because of the patriarchal society, they did not uh, count women and children. So we know that this number probably equaled double the number of men that were there. And Jesus fed them with just the little that this boy had to offer. You know, here's the thing for me. I know when I get caught up at times where I'm struggling to, to really believe that God can be a provider, it's because often I've forgotten what he has done in my life. This is the idea of the first one called look back. I want you to remember that. If you're sitting wherever you're at right now, say look back. You can say it a little louder. Look back. Look back. That's what we have to do at times is look back on where God has brought us from. A lot of the times we don't even pay attention to what God has brought us through already. We don't pay attention to the testimonies that we already have. Like me, I told you before, I have blinders on. I'm so worried about what's coming next. I'm moving so fast at times. And then I get to a place where I have a need and I need the Lord to meet it. And I get fearful as if he hasn't met my needs in the past before. The Lord is a provider. All we have to do sometimes is look back and remember. Remember what God has done. Remember what he has brought each and every one of us through. Scripture in 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. For consider what great things he has done for you. I think all of us have a story already, even if you're in the pit right now, where you can say, I've seen God's hand. I've seen what he's done. Maybe it's in someone else's life, a loved one's life, and you look and you say, wow, I remember the moment when I had nothing and the Lord showed up and provided the next one is look up. Look up. After we look back and we remember what God has done, the next step is to look up. And the word that I put with this is to repent, which simply means to turn from the things that are not of God and look up to what God is doing. Cynicism is something I struggle with. I'll be really honest with you all. There are times where I can get really cynical about things, things that I haven't seen work before, products, whether it is systems or whatever else, and I can think that there's just no hope for certain things. And I know that that is part of the thing that God is still trying to root out of me. And oftentimes I have to repent of that cynicism and look up and look up and look to the one who provides. It's all about where we fix our eyes. I remember back, I couldn't have been any more than 12. And there is a, uh, a theme park and it's like kind of Snoopy themed in Northern Michigan. It's called Michigan Adventures. And it's closely related to a theme park. If you ever heard of Cedar Point, uh, it's very much like that, but much older. And so my parents took our family on a vacation when I was about 12 to go up to Muskegon, Michigan in the north to visit Michigan Adventures. We had a little downtime and so we decided to go walk around the mall. My mom wanted to walk around the mall. As we were walking around the mall, you know, we're holding our parents' hands. I've got two younger siblings. So it's, it's Jalen, Kayla, and Kelsey. Kayla and Kelsey are my younger sisters. And Kelsey being the youngest at this time, I would say Kelsey might have been six or seven years old. We're walking through the mall and all of a sudden, my dad looks up and, we, and he looks around and he says, where is Kelsey, the youngest? And we don't know how long she had been gone, but ultimately like we all began to freak out. I began to freak out and look around frantically and my mom began to worry and, and get extremely anxious. She's looking, looking around. She's kind of just stuck where she is. My other sister, Kayla, she's doing the same thing. She's, she's trying to make sure mom's okay. And we're all looking around frantically. And then I look and my dad, he is sprinting back down the track around the mall 
to go back to find and pursue finding my sister. Now the awesome thing is, is my sister wasn't fire. She was actually back in the food court staring at people eat their food. We always make fun of her now. Like, what were you doing? Why are you standing there watching people eat? But anyways, my dad found her. But I remember it was such a defining moment for me to be able to look up to my dad and say, wow, when everything's frantic, he is able to have the wherewithal to pull himself together and run back and pursue and find my sister. It was like the most heroic thing I could have ever seen him do as a 12-year-old boy looking up and watching his father. And I think it's moments like that where we need to look at God and moments where things are unstable and things are frantic and we don't know what to do. We don't know what's going on. We don't know whether to go left or whether to go right. We don't, we don't know whether we should stop. We're just kind of stuck where we're at. It's moments where we need to look at God. We need to look up and understand that just like my dad was, he is sprinting forward and he is fighting and searching on your behalf, making a way, providing for you every step of the way. God is a great provider. Colossians 3.2 tells us, set your minds on the things above, not earthly things. It's really easy to get complacent in this thing called life, to look at things like money and resources as the only thing that has the ability to meet our needs. These are earthly things. These are earthly things, which are very important. There are people dying across the world of things like hunger. Food is extremely important. And the resources that the Lord allows us to use as tools are great tools to meet needs and provide for people. So don't, uh, don't hear me saying that like there's a disregard for the physical and tangible resources that we need to live life. Life. But at the same time, we need to understand that we serve a God that is not practical. He operates outside of our bounds of practicality. He is a God that while we have the resources and things like money that we need to depend on, he is a God that supersedes that. He has an ability to provide in a way that we don't even fully comprehend. And so we need to constantly understand that we've got to set our minds. We've got to look up. We've got to set our minds on the one who is the creator and giver of all things. He is the source of everything. And that's where we need to put our hope and our trust in. We need to posture our hearts in a heart of repentance saying, Lord, Lord, please forgive us as we turn from ever doubting your ability. And we need to look up and put all of our hope and our trust in the one who provides. The last step is to look forward. So it was look back, look up, look forward. And I want to read the scripture out of 1 Peter, verse, starting at verse, chapter 1, starting at verse 7. And it says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Now, I know this message is about provision, and I, I want to be sensitive to everyone who is watching today. You might be in a situation at home where you're like, I hear you, Jalen. You're saying that God provides, but I just don't know him in that way. Life has been hard. That's all I've ever known is a hard life, a life of struggle. All I've ever known is, is not having what I need. All I've ever known is just, you know, things just not going the way that I hoped for them to go. And I want to speak to you in this moment. Is God loves you and God sees you and he is still a provider. And I would ask you to just look, look back on the moments of your life where you have to see and you understand that God has been a part of your story every step of the way. And part of the way that he writes your story 
is through some of the struggles that you go through, some of the tests and some of the trials that you endure and you persevere through. He can use the pain that you've gone through to become your platform to reach so many more for this kingdom-centered salvation that he's talking about here in 1 Peter. I'm telling you, God is a provider. And when we go through hard things, it strengthens our faith. There are seasons that we go through where we're in droughts and we're waiting for rain to come. But it seems like the rain is not coming. It seems like we can't make ends meet, maybe. Maybe it seems like those relationships are broken and they're so past healing, so far away from healing that, they, that there's nothing, not even an intervention from God can heal those relationships. Maybe that's a marriage. Maybe that's a relationship with your son or your daughter. Maybe it's a relationship with your own parent. Wherever you are right now and whatever you're going through, I'm telling you, you can trust and you can hope in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loves you and he promises us that he will never leave us. And also understand that as you go through these tests and trials, your faith is being strengthened. It's being purified like gold. It's going and it's being tested and pressed and crushed in the fire. At the end of it, you come out like pure gold, withstanding the tests and trials that you endure and go through. No, Hebrews 11 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Having the ability to hope in something and trust in something that you cannot see, it takes a supernatural act, and that is our faith. That is our faith. That is trusting in a God that we cannot see. But when we're able to look back and see his hand in our lives, it becomes most evident why we should trust and hope in a future. Philippians, one of my favorite verses, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Jesus has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is simply saying this is the whole look forward thing. Is it's like you might be struggling right now, you might be in the midst of it, but in the midst of your test and in the midst of your trial, press, press on towards what God has called you to. I'll end with this story. When I left my full time job at the church that I worked as the, the worship arts director at back in January, it was a huge step of faith I felt the Lord calling me to. And I struggled with making that decision. And as many of you all know, one of the things I'm most passionate about is justice. And so I know that is a very hot topic word right now. And I really have a heart for people simply just knowing one another. That's my heart. I believe scripture tells us to do justice, tells us in Micah that we need to do justice and love mercy. I think justice is essential to the gospel. And so I left my full-time job to be able to pursue a path that creates a more just and equitable society. And in doing that, there were so many moments of discouragement for me, whether that came through people or a lack of resources or frustration in understanding the way to approach the issues that we have and we see and we deal with today. But really, I became extremely discouraged at one point. Okay, I'm really discouraged where I was like, I just don't know if I can keep going on. And this scripture encouraged me where it says, press towards the mark. Press towards what God is calling you to. Even if it looks like you're not going to make it. Even if it looks like you don't have enough. Even if it looks like everything and everyone is against you. Keep pursuing exactly what God has called you to. He has a purpose for your life and he has something for you and he is going to provide and give you exactly what you need exactly what you need to accomplish the mission that he set you on so be encouraged today be encouraged no matter what place you're in right now no matter where you're at be encouraged because God loves you he's got your back and he's going to give you exactly what you need to accomplish the mission that he set you on and for those of you listening, if there's anyone listening today 
who's like, I am struggling right now. I can't even feed my family. I can't make ends meet. This is what the church community is for. I challenge you to reach out. Reach out to someone. Reach out to someone at East Town. Text that number. Send an email. Get in touch with the church. Because one thing the church has the ability to do is God can use the church to meet the needs of his people. If there is a need in this community, make sure you reach out. I implore you to reach out. And this is a time where we can have a moment too as the church. Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, I'm not struggling right now. I've got resources. The Lord is taking care of me. I know him as a provider. Well, one way that you can support those who do not have is by supporting your church. So I want to take a moment right now. This is our give moment. A moment where you can give to the mission that God has set this church on. Where we can be a church that meets the needs of God's people. Where we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in a very tangible way. It's really simple to, to give. The number's popping up on the screen. You can text the word give, G-Y-V-E, to that number. And you can give that way. I thank you all for being on mission with East Town. It is amazing to be part of this community. I hope you were encouraged today and that you can lean in and understand that God is fighting on your behalf. He loves you more than you could ever imagine and he is the greatest provider we'll ever know. He will meet every need that you need to be able to accomplish the mission that he set you on. Never forget that. So look back, look up, and look forward. I love you all. I thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm praying blessing over this community. I'm praying blessing over each and every one of us. Uh, I'm just grateful to be part of a community that is on mission like this. Will you all take care and certainly enjoy the rest of your week. Love you all.